In the midst of the Second World War, under the tranquil waves of the Pacific Ocean, the Japanese submarine I-25 set course towards the United States. With a daring mission to attack the American mainland, it unleashed its secret weapon, a small Yokosuka E-14Y floatplane, over the unsuspecting landscapes of Oregon. Today, we unravel this overlooked chapter of history, exploring the audacious journey of the I-25 and its unexpected assault on Oregon. Welcome to our deep dive into the saga of the Japanese submarine I-25. The Type B-1 submarine I-25 of the Imperial Japanese Navy participated in the attack on Pearl Harbor and uniquely accomplished an aerial bombing on the mainland United States during the war, specifically in the Fort Stevens bombardment and the lookout air raids, both incidents taking place in Oregon. At a length of 108 meters or 354 feet 4 inches, the I-25 weighed 2,600 tons and had a range of 14,000 nautical miles, a top speed on the surface of 23.5 knots, and a highest submerged speed of 8 knots. Its equipment included a disassembled Yokosuka E-14Y two-seater reconnaissance seaplane, Glenn to the Allies, stored in a hangar near the conning tower. In the course of the Second World War, Lieutenant Commander Akiji Tagami, a graduate of Class 51 at Etajima, Hiroshima, took command of I-25, with 26-year-old Lieutenant Tatsuo Tsukudo as his executive officer, XO. The I-25 departed Yokosuka on the 21st of November, 1941, ready for conflict. Together with three additional submarines, I-25 performed patrol duties 120 nautical miles north of Oahu during the Japanese onslaught on Pearl Harbor. After the attack, as Japanese aircraft carriers navigated west, I-25 and eight other submarines traveled eastward to monitor the U.S. west coast. The I-25 patrolled near the Columbia River mouth. Scheduled coastal city shelling on Christmas Eve 1941 was called off due to frequent air and surface patrols. I-25 engaged the SS Connecticut nine nautical miles off the U.S. coast. The damaged tanker managed to elude capture, eventually running aground at the Columbia River mouth. I-25 then made its way back to Kwajalein, arriving on the 11th of January 1942 for refueling and refurbishment. On the 5th of February, I-25 departed Kwajalein Atoll in the Marshall Islands for a subsequent operational patrol in the South Pacific. Tagami was tasked to reconnoiter Australian harbors of Sydney, Melbourne, and Hobart, as well as New Zealand harbors of Wellington and Auckland. I-25 proceeded on the surface for nine days but switched to night surface travel as it neared the Australian coastline. By Saturday, the 14th of February, I-25 was a few miles off the Sydney coast. Sydney's searchlights were visible from the I-25 bridge. Tagami subsequently took I-25 100 nautical miles southeast of Sydney. Days of severe swells delayed the immediate launch of the Glen floatplane. I-25 stayed submerged during the day, resurfacing at night. Finally, on Tuesday, the 17th of February, Warrant Flying Officer Nobuo Fujita executed a reconnaissance flight over Sydney Harbor with the Glen, primarily to observe Sydney's airbase. By 0730, Fujita had returned to I-25, disassembled the Glen, and stored it in the watertight hangar. Tagami then directed I-25 southwards on the surface at 14 knots. By midday on Wednesday, the 18th of February, they were approximately 400 nautical miles southeast of Sydney, maintaining a southward course. Their subsequent operation was a similar reconnaissance flight over Melbourne. Tagami elected to dispatch the aircraft from Cape Wickham, at the northern extremity of King Island at the western terminus of Bass Strait, located roughly equidistant between Victoria and Tasmania. The floatplane embarked on its intelligence gathering mission to Melbourne, flying over Port Phillip Bay on the 26th of February. Fujita's ensuing surveillance flight in Australia occurred over Hobart on the 1st of March. After this, I-25 charted a course for New Zealand, where Fujita undertook another scouting flight, this time over Wellington on the 8th of March. Fujita subsequently flew over Auckland on the 13th of March, followed by an overflight of Fiji on the 17th of March. I-25 made its return to Kwajalein base on the 31st of March before heading to Yokosuka for refurbishment. The submarine was in Yokosuka dry dock number 5 on the 18th of April 1942, when one of the B-25 Mitchell bombers from the Doolittle raid inflicted damage on the Japanese aircraft carrier Ryuho, 
situated in the adjacent dry dock number four. While traversing past the Aleutian Islands on its third war patrol along the western coast of North America, I-25's Glenn Seaplane conducted an overflight of U.S. military installations on Kodiak Island. This surveillance mission, executed on the 21st of May, 1942, was a preparatory measure for the northern diversion linked to the Battle of Midway. Just after the stroke of midnight on the 20th of June, 1942, I-25 deployed a torpedo against the new coal-powered Canadian freighter SS Fort Camosun off the Washington coast. The freighter, destined for England, was laden with war materials such as zinc, lead, and plywood. A torpedo struck the port side beneath the bridge, flooding the second and third cargo holds. At dawn, Canadian corvettes Quesnel and Edmonston arrived at the distressed freighter and rescued the crew from lifeboats. The Fort Camosun was towed back to Puget Sound for repairs and later survived another torpedo attack from I-27 in the Gulf of Aden in autumn 1943. On the evening of the 21st of June 1942, I-25 used a flotilla of fishing vessels as cover to navigate minefields near the mouth of the Columbia River in Oregon. I-25 discharged 17 14-centimeter shells towards Battery Russell, a small coastal army unit within Fort Stevens which was eventually decommissioned. Fort Stevens was armed with two 10-inch disappearing guns, several 12-inch mortars, 75mm field guns, 50 caliber machine guns, along with searchlights, observation posts, and covert radar capacity. The damage was minor, impacting only a baseball backstop and some power and telephone lines. The incoming shell fire significantly stirred the personnel at Battery Russell. Men sprang from their beds, colliding with objects in the darkness. Switching on a light was out of the question, as they hurried to their battle stations clad in their underwear. Captain Jack R. Wood, the battery's commander, later related to historian Bert Weber, We looked like hell, but we were ready to shoot back in a couple of minutes. However, when gunners asked for authorization to retaliate, they were strictly denied. Partly this was due to the uncertainty surrounding the submarine's position compounded by discrepancies in reports from diverse observation points. It was, after all, 10 miles from the shore. Moreover, officials later clarified they refrained from retaliating to avoid disclosing their artillery positions, as they suspected a reconnaissance operation. The submarine might also have been out of reach of Battery Russell's weaponry. The configuration of the 10-inch disappearing guns restricted their elevation, thereby capping their effective range to less than 10 miles. If the battery had fired, the submarine could report back to Tokyo that a squadron of surface ships could just anchor 10 miles offshore and bombard Battery Russell unimpeded, then sail unchallenged into the Columbia, where valuable targets included the Oregon Shipbuilding Corporation in Portland, one of Henry Kaiser's shipyards, which was manufacturing Liberty ships at a rate of over one per week. This was a risk the Navy was unwilling to take. Ultimately, Battery Russell stood its ground, taking the incoming fire without retaliating. This incident marked a turning point for American coastal artillery, with the failure to respond prompting a reassessment of manpower and artillery dedicated to coastal defense. The Fort Stevens shelling constituted the only instance of an attack by the Axis powers on a military base within the contiguous United States during World War II, and it was the second time a continental U.S. military base had been assaulted by an enemy since the bombing of Dutch Harbor two weeks prior. Post his successful reconnaissance missions during the second and third patrols, Warrant Officer Nubuo Fujita was specifically selected for a special incendiary bombing mission aimed at igniting forest fires in North America. I-25 departed Yokosuka on the 15th of August 1942, loaded with six 76-kilogram incendiary bombs. On the 9th of September, the crew launched the Glen again, which dropped two bombs over forest land near Brookings, Oregon. This enemy aircraft assault was later dubbed the Lookout Air Raids, marking the only instance when the mainland United States was ever bombed by enemy aircraft. Warrant Officer Fujita's assignment was to spark wildfires across the coast. 
At the time, the Tillamook burn events of 1933 and 1939 were well recognized, as was the city of Bandon, Oregon's annihilation by a smaller, uncontrolled wildfire in 1936. However, light winds, damp weather, and the prompt response from two fire lookouts ensured the fires were contained, while a recent rainstorm had left the area saturated, aiding the fire lookouts in managing the blaze. In fact, if the winds had been strong enough to instigate widespread forest fires, the lightweight Glen might have encountered difficulty navigating adverse weather conditions. Shortly after the Glen seaplane had landed and been disassembled for storage, I-25 was attacked by a United States Army A-29 Hudson, piloted by Captain Gene H. Daugherty from McCord Field near Tacoma, Washington. The Hudson was armed with 300-pound general-purpose demolition bombs with delayed fuses rather than depth charges. The bombs inflicted minor damage, but the swift intervention by a Coast Guard cutter and three more aircraft prompted I-25 to be more cautious during a second bombing raid on the 29th of September 1942. The Glenn seaplane was assembled and launched in the pre-dawn darkness using Cape Blanco light as a guide. The aircraft was heard at 0522 by a work crew at the Grassy Knob Lookout seven miles east of Port Orford, Oregon. However, fire crews from the Gold Beach Ranger Station were unable to locate any trace of the two incendiary bombs dropped. The Glenn seaplane was recovered again, but I-25 chose not to risk a third flight with the remaining two incendiary bombs. Captain Tagami directed I-25 to rest on the bottom of the harbor of Port Orford until nighttime. At 0415 on the 4th of October 1942, I-25 targeted the 6,706 tons tanker Camden, which was transporting 76,000 barrels of gasoline from San Pedro, California to Puget Sound. The wounded tanker was towed to the mouth of the Columbia River. When it was determined its draft was too deep to reach the repair facilities in Portland, Oregon, a secondary tow to Puget Sound was arranged. However, the tanker was destroyed on the 10th of October by a fire of unknown cause during the second tow. On the evening of the 5th of October 1942, I-25 torpedoed the Richfield Oil Company tanker Larry Dehaney, which sank the following day. The cargo of 66,000 barrels of oil was lost along with two of the tanker's crew and four members of the United States Navy Armed Guard. Survivors reached Port Orford, Oregon on the evening of the 6th of October. As I-25 was making its way back to Japan, two submarines were sighted on the 11th of October, 1942 approximately 800 miles off the Washington coast. I-25 launched its final torpedo at the lead submarine, which sunk within 20 seconds with all hands lost. While I-25 reported sinking a U.S. submarine, the actual victim was the Soviet L-16, en route from Vladivostok to the Panama Canal via Unalaska, Alaska and San Francisco, along with L-15. Sergei Andreevich Mihailov, United States Navy Chief Photographer's mate from Arcadia, California, was on board L-16 as a liaison officer and interpreter, and perished with the rest of the crew. The United States Navy Western Sea Frontier denied any submarine loss and concealed information about the Soviet loss due to the Soviet Union's official neutrality and the conflict between Japan and the United States. The SSHM story transporting fuel oil from Noumea, New Caledonia, in the South Pacific Ocean to Los Angeles, was torpedoed and fired upon by I-25 on 17 May 1943. Two crew members were killed in the attack. 63 crew members made it to the ship's lifeboats before she sank. The survivors were rescued by the USS Fletcher and brought to Port Vila Efe, Vanuatu in the South Pacific. Less than a year later, I-25 was sunk in a series of naval engagements from late August to mid-September 1943 off the New Hebrides Islands, about 150 miles northeast of Espiritu Santo by one or more of the destroyers USS Ellet, USS Patterson, USS Wadsworth, or USS Softly. The exact American ship responsible for sinking I-25 or any other Japanese submarines in the area remains unclear. On the 24th of October, 1943, the Imperial Japanese Navy announced that I-25 was presumed lost with all 100 men on board in the Fiji area, 
and it was removed from the Navy list on the 1st of December, 1943. Two decades later, the pilot of the float plane, Nobuo Fujita, was invited back to Brookings. Prior to his trip, the Japanese government was assured he would not be prosecuted as a war criminal. In Brookings, Fujita served as Grand Marshal for the local Azalea Festival. During the festival, Fujita gifted his family's 400-year-old samurai sword to the city as a token of reconciliation. Fujita visited Brookings several more times, acting as an informal ambassador of peace and friendship. Inspired by the warm reception he received in the United States, in 1985 Fujita invited three students from Brookings to visit Japan. During the students' visit, Fujita received a commendation letter from an aide of President Ronald Reagan with admiration for your kindness and generosity. Fujita returned to Brookings in 1990, 1992, and 1995. In 1992, he planted a tree at the bomb site as a peace gesture. In 1995, he transferred the samurai sword from the Brookings City Hall to the new library's display case. He was declared an honorary citizen of Brookings a few days before his death on the 30th of September 1997, at the age of 85. In October 1998, his daughter Yoriko Asakura buried some of Fujita's ashes at the bomb site. Thanks for watching. Remember to like and subscribe. See you soon.